The next speaker is going to take two of us to introduce. <laughs> I'll simply say this, because I had the privilege of also facilitating the uh, presentation after lunch. I'll say more, but I just want to tell you this, that uh, our next speaker is here because of Amazon. I can tell you, it's just Amazon. Amazon has a wonderful way that when you buy a book on Amazon, they'll tell you, you might consider other books. Well, I bought a book on uh, Martin Luther back in 2017 by a, an Oxford scholar by the name of Linda Roper. I saw it at Andrew's board. Uh, uh, when I was up at Andrew's board meeting. I went over to the bookstore at Andrew's University, and I saw this book. I said, ah, I like that book. So I picked up this thick book and read it. I was enjoying it so much. I said, what other books should I be reading about uh, the Reformation? And in that, I came across a book called uh, Protestantism, The Faith That Changed the Modern World. And I'll tell you more about that at lunchtime, after lunch, because uh, we have something special for each of you. But that's how I became acquainted with our speaker. And in the credits of that book, he gives credit to Washington Adventist University in the book. Because... Dr. Alec Rywe was a speaker. Yeah, there, I got one out WAU. Where are you at? All right, that's a table of WAU people here. Uh, Dr. Rywe actually um, presented uh, a lecture, part of the lecture series, a key lecture series a couple of years ago, and I think he was already referred to you by Dr. David Trim. So I'm going to ask David to come up and help us with this introduction, kind of keep my comments brief. David has more technical details. But Alec uh, is a professor of history and religion, and David can tell us more. Dr. Trim, please. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to introduce Professor Alec Ryrie, uh, who is, I think, one of the leading historians, firstly, of the English and British Reformation, but increasingly one of the leading historians of religion, not just limited to uh, the British Isles. Uh, his PhD or rather, actually, it's not a PhD, it's a DPhil from the Oxford University, because Oxford is particular and they have to have their own acronyms. A mere PhD isn't good enough, so they have a DPhil. Um, in theology from St. Cross College, Oxford. Uh, his PhD examined how early English Protestant reformers interacted with that interesting King Henry VIII. Um, he taught at the University of Birmingham from 1999 to 2006, and since then has been professor of the history of Christianity at Durham University in England. For three years, he was head of the Department of Theology and Religion. He's president of the Ecclesiastical History Society, one of the leading academic societies of, uh, in religious history and co-editor of the Journal of Ecclesiastical History. He's published seven books. Two of them are monographs. One is a textbook. Four books, though, are superbly researched but are written for a wide readership. And they've been published by presses such as Oxford University Press, Random House, Penguin, and Harvard University Press. And they include the book that Elder Wigley mentioned, Be, um, Protestants, The Radicals Who Made the Modern World, which was published in 2017 for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, but takes the story from Luther in Germany up to the present day and spans Asia, Africa, and the Americas. And it includes some very astute assessments, I may say, of Seventh-day Adventists. His latest book just out is Unbelievers, The Religious Quest to Abolish God. Um, he was elected a fellow of the British Academy this year, which is one of the highest honors in, in British um, scholarship. But also, he is a believer himself. And I actually recall talking with Alec around the time he moved from Birmingham in the history department to Durham in the theology department, and he said something along the lines of, I think I've established now my credibility as an historian, so now I can do what I'm more interested in, which is teaching in the theology department. And he's interested in it because he himself is a believer. He is a reader in the Church of England, which is effectively a lay preacher. Uh, and uh, though his theological views would, would differ in some ways from my own uh, and from Adventists. He believes in Jesus Christ and that's the most important thing we have in common. One reason our pioneers always call themselves the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, not the Seventh-day Adventist church, is because they recognize that the church is the church of believers in Jesus Christ. And so we historically thought of ourselves as a denomination within the church.
uh, and Alec is uh, a member and a, and a believer in the church, and that's one reason I know that Elder Wigley was, uh, was pleased to invite him to speak. That and the fact that he really is uh, an absolute expert, so uh, in passing over to him, we are going to be in very good hands. Thank you all. That's a, a, a daunting introduction to follow. Um, I'm honored by the invitation to be here today, to be part of, of this event. I'm also very conscious that I'm an outsider here, that I'm a, I'm a fish out of water. So with a view to lowering your expectations after that, let me start by telling you what I am and what I'm not. Um, I am, of course, not an Adventist. I'm an, an Anglican, or at least I'm a member of the Church of England, which I would argue is not quite the same thing. i happily talk about that later in the event anybody's interested. And I'm not a theologian. I am, like David, a historian. And that means that what I'm fundamentally interested in is people, is my fellow believers in the past and even in our own times, rather than in the abstract intricacies of what they believe. And in the particular part of the history of Christianity that I'm most at home in is the Reformation era, the age when the Protestant tradition, in all its breadth and depth and glory and shame, came into being. We in the Church of England are heirs to that Reformation, although not unproblematically so. Um, you in the Seventh-day Adventist Church are also heirs to it, again with the odd bump along the way, as we were hearing earlier. So what I'm here to do today is to talk about our shared heritage and what it might mean to us. I'm not, I should say, going to be talking about the Adventist story in particular, for all that it's a subject that I'm interested in, for the very good reason that probably everybody in this room knows more about it than I do. I'm going to be talking about the wider Protestant inheritance, both the aspects of it that seem to me worth celebrating and treasuring, and the parts that are more problematic for us. And in the first of the two lectures I'm going to be presenting today this morning, I'm going to be keeping my eye firmly on the history. We'll be staying mostly in the 16th and 17th centuries, looking at material that I think is important and interesting in its own right, I hope so, but is also formative for modern Protestantism, whether in its Adventist, its Anglican, or many other varieties. And this afternoon, in the second lecture, I'm going to be taking a longer perspective and bringing some parts of the story up to the present, and maybe thinking briefly about how that affects the dilemmas that we face of how to be faithful stewards of the gospel in the times and places where we're called to serve. Now, unavoidably, I'm going to do this from an Anglican perspective. As the man said, I can do no other. But the more I've learned about the Adventist story and its modern developments, the more familiar it seems to me. So I hope that this view from outside will be of some use or at least some interest. Um, and as the great Puritan divines used to advise anyone who was listening to an untried preacher, I hope that you'll be able to pick out the kernels of nourishment and to forgive and ignore the, the plentiful chaff surrounding it. <laughs> okay, I need my control. We need to begin, who else, with Martin Luther. In his great book, The Liberty of a Christian, written in 1520, this is what he says. One thing, and one thing alone, is necessary for life, justification, and Christian liberty. And that is, well, faith, right? Or grace? No. The most holy word of God, the gospel of Christ. The soul can do without everything except the word of God, without which none at all of its wants are provided for. But having the word, it's rich and wants for nothing. Now, as you know, as David was saying earlier, Luther summed up his theology in this pair of principles that give us the title for our proceedings today, sola scriptura and sola fide. 
and which sometimes have added to them grace alone, Christ alone, glory to God alone. But those first two are at the heart. And you'll notice that these are different kinds of principles, these two. The relationship between them, between faith and the word, these two things, each of which is said to be alone, that already tells you we're in, we're in slightly strange territory. Um, the relationship between them is something that I'm going to be coming back to during these lectures. For now, what I want you to notice is that as Luther presents it here in 1520, it's scripture that comes first. That's the foundation in this telling on which everything else is built. And he goes on to explain that the reason faith matters is that faith is the only and exclusive means through which we can receive the word. We need the word alone. Faith alone is the only means we can get it. And this is what he goes on to spend the bulk of that book, The Liberty of a Christian, talking about. But in doing that, he skates over a different, a more awkward question. What is this word of God, anyway? And what does the word of God have to do with the texts contained in the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments. Now, most Protestants, not all, have generally been of the view that those two categories, the Word of God and the contents of the Bible, map perfectly onto each other. But that's not a view that has commanded universal assent from Christians generally. And it's also not self-evidently true, or at least it's not self-evidently true to everybody. And since, as I say, it's foundational, I think it's a genuinely important problem. And that problem, the way that that problem was thrashed out, in particular by the first few generations of Protestants who explored most of the features of it that might still trouble us today, that problem is my subject for this first lecture. Forgive me if this seems to you like a subject too simple and obvious to be worth addressing. The fact that makes it worth our attention, I think, is the very fact that it seems so simple and obvious to many people and not to others. Okay, but a wider context to this. The early church inherited from Pharisaic Judaism a view of the books of the Hebrew Bible as scripture. Those who questioned that, and it was questioned in the early church, were refuted by a number of arguments of which the simplest and most effective was that Jesus himself plainly treated the Hebrew Bible as inspired scripture. And if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for us. Whether that same status extended to the deuterocanonical books, that Protestants call the Old Testament Apocrypha. That was unclear from the beginning. Uh, Protestants who tend to be dismissive of those books should at least remember that when the New Testament quotes the Old, it quotes the Greek translation of it, the Septuagint, and it quotes it as if it were authoritative scripture, not merely a translation of it. And then Within the first century itself, some of the writings associated with the apostles are being treated as scripture. Second Peter you know, famously uses that word about Paul's writings. There's a remarkable degree of agreement, actually, about the emerging canon of the New Testament, about what, what should be in. But there's also a definite zone of uncertainty about that canon in the early church. A handful of books whose status was questionable, including some that eventually did and some that eventually didn't make, into, make, the, make their way into the New Testament that we have. In this, and also in the formation of the Hebrew Bible, of, the, of, of that canon, you can see two opposing principles at work as believers worked out the boundaries of Scripture in fear and trembling, in awe of their responsibility. On the one side, there's a principle of exclusion, the principle that says we dare not include a text unless we are sure that it's inspired. We fear in case these texts get corrupted. 
That's a fear that you see running through the New Testament, whether it's the way that Paul refers to his distinctive handwriting as a way of assuring the Galatians that this is really him, um, or, or, or you know, to the blood-curdling warnings in the final chapter of the book of Revelation against messing with the text. So that principle leads to a tight canon. It leads to leaving things out if you're not sure. And then on the other side, there's a principle of inclusion. We dare not leave out anything that God has said to us. We dare not forget anything. We will treasure every last scrap that may have some savor of the word to it. So we'll include Mark's gospel, even though there's very little in it that's not in the others, even though some of the unique material has got troubling discrepancies with other accounts. We're going to include brief and you know, almost inconsequential texts like Second and Third John, not because we see them as foundational to any particular core doctrines, but because they are or they appear to be genuine letters from a genuine apostle. And so you're going to treasure them the same way that you treasure letters from a lover, almost regardless of what they actually say. And those two principles played out against one another and eventually met, and we have the canon of Scripture. Now, if you're a Roman Catholic, then you've probably come to the wrong meeting. Um, <laughs> but if, if, if you were, then the story from here is simple. If you were Eastern Orthodox, it would be a little different, but let's leave that aside. On the Catholic view, the church, the bride of Christ the body of Christ, which Paul speaks of, the church founded on the rock of Peter, prince of the apostles, governed by those apostles and their successors, illuminated even in its darkest hours by the Holy Spirit. The church is the heir to the teaching of Christ, and it transmits that teaching down to the present. By far the most important deposit of that teaching is Scripture, but it's not the only one. And Scripture itself derives its authority from the fact that the church transmits and witnesses to it. St. Augustine in the 5th century famously said that he would not believe in Scripture unless the church had given it to him. That's a principle which the early Protestant reformers find embarrassing. And there's also for Catholics a deposit of tradition which lies outside Scripture the so-called unwritten verities. These traditions are how Catholics accept the Apostles' Creed, for example. It's how they know that infants as well as adults may be baptized. It's how they know that the Virgin Mary was, in, was immaculately conceived, remained a virgin throughout her life, and was at last bodily assumed into heaven. And, of course, it's how Catholics know despite the lack of scriptural warrant for this, that Christians ought to celebrate their Sabbath on the first and not the last day of the week. I don't mean to emphasize the Sabbatarian dispute in this setting in order to be cute. It, it was genuinely, in the Reformation period, the most common knockdown argument used by Catholics to defend this doctrine of unwritten verities. The proof that here was a practice, the Sunday Sabbath, which was universally recognized by all Christians, had been done at least since the early second century and couldn't be rooted in scripture. If you were a Protestant who was committed to a Sunday Sabbath, and of course almost all of them were, not quite, but almost all were in those first centuries, this is a genuinely awkward challenge. And of course, we shouldn't imagine that adopting the Seventh-day Sabbath makes the problem go away. Traditions and interpretative inheritance cluster around any church and any denomination. Bare scripture can sometimes seem like a meager deposit of the faith. Protestants, almost as much as Catholics, have often found in practice that alongside scripture, subordinate to it, but alongside it, there may be authoritative rulings or prophetic utterances or communal traditions or shared confessions or norms of the faith, which don't have the same status as scripture, but in practice are binding on the community. 
the writings and pronouncements of people like Martin Luther or John Wesley or Ellen White, people who are very unlike one another and none of them is like St. Peter, and yet there is a comparison to be made. But I'm getting sidetracked. Throughout the European Middle Ages, the Catholic Church's doctrine of authority in which church and scripture speak with a single voice and must inevitably do so because only the church can definitively interpret scripture. During the Middle Ages, this begins to strain credibility. A series of dissident theologians came to feel that the plain words of scripture were so severely in tension with the church's interpretations of them that those interpretations might be false. And if those interpretations are false, then that entire doctrine of authority unravels. Instead of the church witnessing to and guaranteeing scripture's authority, scripture becomes an authority by which to judge the church, a yardstick to measure it against, against which it can be found wanting. Martin Luther was not the first person to do this, um, but nobody before him had done it with quite such unapologetic verve, um, nor with the same degree of theological thoroughness. It was a very effective polemical gambit, and I'll be coming to that after lunch. For now, what I want you to notice is the problematic logical basis that it rested on. Like a modern atheist who uses his God-given faculty of reasoned argument to argue that there is no God and therefore no such thing as reason, um, Luther risked as his opponents saw it, using the church-given gift of scripture to argue that the church was false, and therefore that the scripture that it affirmed was of no more authority than any other ancient book. It's not an insoluble problem, but it is a problem. As Catholics persistently asked through the Reformation period and beyond, you appeal to the Bible, but what makes you so sure that it is in fact the word of God? Now, if there's one key thing that I want you to notice about the Reformation response to this challenge, it's this, that Protestants were, to a surprising extent, unbothered by it. They gave relatively little direct attention to this problem. And when they do attend to it, they don't do it with a sense of anxiety and trepidation, but with a sense that this question is almost too obvious to be worth us answering. Now, on the face of it, this is odd. It's not just that Catholic theologians are posing this question insistently and aggressively. This is also the era when serious scholarly study of the biblical text was getting going. Erasmus of Rotterdam, the greatest scholar of the generation before the Reformation, had tried to reopen the question of the New Testament canon. In particular, he mounted a cogent argument that the book of Revelation should never have been included in the New Testament. He also more or less established, I mean, which nowadays is uncontroversial, that the letter to the Hebrews was not in fact written by Paul. Most medieval theologians had held it to be, to be Pauline. And, but establishing that it's in fact anonymous leaves a major question mark over it. Uh, um, you know, it's, it's not of apostolic authorship, and also you've got that problematic passage in chapter 6, which can be taken to mean that forgiveness for a sin that you've previously repented of is impossible. Um, and in fact, Luther famously denies that those two books, Revelation and Hebrews, along with the epistles of James and of Jude, he denies that those books are written by apostles, and he takes them out of their normal place in the New Testament and puts them at the end in a sort of relegation. I mean, obviously, Revelation and Jude are there anyway, but um, he put, puts those four as a separate block at the end of the New Testament. They're not being expelled from Scripture, but they're, they're definitely being put on notice. Now, part of this is to do with Luther's very distinctive understanding of what Scripture is and of his understanding of the Word of God in particular, which I want to come back to in the next session. So let's bracket that for the moment. I just want you to notice that the new biblical scholarship in this period is making the question of how we can trust the Bible more difficult. And that's something that is only going to get worse. 
during the course of the 16th and 17th centuries, a series of minor problems, just kind of quibbles, start to accumulate. The most neuralgic of these is the so-called Johannine comma. This is the verse in the first epistle of John, which had traditionally been used as the best biblical proof text for the doctrine of the Trinity. Here it is in the King James Bible, which follows the traditional reading. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. But by the time of the King James translation in 1611, this is already looking pretty dubious. It's becoming clear that the most authoritative and the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament tended not to include that Trinitarian slam dunk in verse 7. Most modern biblical translations, of course, leave it out. And, and that's only one of a host of textual problems. There are minor variations in the manuscript witness, the knotty problem of how vowels are marked in Hebrew and whether those markings are themselves part of the inspired witness of Scripture. Now, on, on one level, these, these problems are, are minor and inconsequential. They only affect a small fraction of the biblical text. And that means that if you want to ignore them, you can but they can't simply be shrugged off because there's an awfully big difference between inspired and mostly inspired um, or inspired you know, with some problems. And indeed, that difference is almost intolerable. These little worries about the biblical text are like chisel taps on a case of dynamite, apparently trivial concerns, but they threaten to blow the whole thing open. So how do early Protestants deal with them? Well, of course, on one level, they deal with these historical and textual problems case by case, verse by verse, fighting every question, and that's a process which continues down to the present. And that close-up, hand-to-hand polemical combat is, is probably unavoidable. It certainly scored some impressive achievements, and for some troubled believers, it was and remains important. And, of course, it keeps biblical scholars off the streets. But there is a limited sense in which those sorts of arguments can actually solve the problem. Most biblical scholars claimed to have solutions, but unfortunately they disagreed amongst themselves about what the solutions were. And there's also a queasy sense that they're mounting ex post facto arguments. In other words, they've decided before they started that they were going to defend a traditional view of biblical authority, and they then went out to look for any arguments that they could find in order to make that case, which lent a kind of unsettling air of dishonesty to the whole proceedings. When they concluded triumphantly that everything's okay, that you can trust the Bible entirely, readers might be forgiven for thinking, well, they would say that, wouldn't they? Ordinary lay people, wanting to know how they can trust the Bible could be forgiven amidst this blizzard of scholarship for concluding that certain knowledge of the word of God is beyond their reach, maybe beyond anyone's reach. This is not a theoretical problem. If you read the diaries, the letters of Protestants in the 16th and 17th centuries, never mind since then, you see problems like these eating away at people the New England Puritan, Michael Wigglesworth, remembered, he wrote in his diary that uh, on one Sunday in 1653, he spent the day being sadly assaulted with doubting whether ever word of the scripture were infallible. And this because he'd been reading about variant versions of the text and the problem of Hebrew vowel markings. An English woman around the same time recalled that when I'd read the word of God, the devil tempted me with doubts and questions touching some things therein, whether it was truth or not. That sort of thought was a woodworm eating away at the crossbeams of your faith. One teenage English girl named Mary Gunter wrote of how she was plagued by the thought that the scriptures are not his word. She couldn't shake this off. Ministers tried to persuade her that her doubts were unfounded. And instead, she said, they made her wonder, how could she be sure that this was the truth that she now professed, seeing there are as many or more learned men of the one opinion as of the other? And they all maintain their opinions by the scriptures. You try and argue away with your doubts, and it makes them worse. 
But while these arguments generated a huge snowstorm of books to and fro, we shouldn't be distracted by them. For a clue of what's really going on beneath all this sound and fury, look to the most intellectually brilliant of the 16th century reformers, John Calvin. Not everybody's favorite theologian today, or in his own time, um, but he is hard to beat for raw brain power, uh, and also more humane and more spiritual than he's sometimes cracked up to be. Anyway, when, when Calvin addressed this question of the Bible's authority in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, he did it in a very particular way. He carefully, and at some length, dismantled the Catholic argument that the Bible derives its authority from the church. He then gave a rather brief and cursory treatment of the various historical and textual arguments for the Bible's accuracy. But he doesn't dwell on them and is careful not to rest too much on them. Instead, he concludes, oh, that was Mary Gunter. He, he says, we ought to seek our conviction in a higher place than human reasons, judgments, or conjectures. That is, in the secret testimony of the Spirit. And he goes on to say, Scripture is indeed self-authenticating. He actually, it's one of the, the rare occasions when he uses a Greek word because he can't find a Latin or French one that will do. Um, the, 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 the word is, is autopistos, and it, it, it's something like it generates trust from within itself. Is the, is, is, is the meaning of it. We feel, not we think, we feel the undoubted power of his divine majesty living and breathing there. A feeling that can be born only of heavenly revelation. I speak of nothing other than what each believer experiences within himself. So on this view, from you know, the, the, the greatest intellect of the Protestant Reformation, the Bible's authority is a matter of feeling of direct, intuitive knowledge, not deductive argument. So this is ultimately a claim less about Scripture itself than about the Holy Spirit. And in the end, it's one which is beyond rational argument. It was sometimes said that arguing for the authority of Scripture was like trying to argue that there is a sun in the sky. John Owen, arguably the greatest of the Puritan theologians, said that light requires neither proof nor testimony for its evidence. Let the sun arise in the firmament, and there's no need of witnesses to prove and confirm unto a seeing man that it's day. That which evidenceth itself is not light. Uh, you can develop all the brilliant astronomical theories you like, but if you really want to know what the sun is, what you should do is turn your face to it and feel the warmth. If you can see it, there's no need to argue, and if you can't, or if you won't, then there is no point in arguing. Uh, incidentally, you can see how this fits with Calvin's strong doctrine of divine predestination and of God's absolute sovereignty. You can feel the authority of Scripture if the Holy Spirit chooses to reveal it to you, and you can't if he doesn't. Either way, there's nothing to argue about. This one-two gambit becomes the, the orthodoxy of reformed Protestantism, of that sort of broad Calvinist Presbyterian tradition. Again and again, we see discussions of the Bible's authority begin with a kind of softening up barrage of rationalistic arguments, followed by that decisive thrust appealing directly to the witness of the Spirit. The Westminster Confession of 1647, what was going to become the definitive confession of faith for, for Presbyterians worldwide, mustered a small platoon of rational arguments for Scripture's authority. It cites the testimony of the church, the heavenliness of the matter, the efficacy of the doctrine, the majesty of the style, the consent of all the parts, you know, the fact that the, 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 the agreement between the, all, all, all the different books of the Bible, the scope of the whole, which is to give glory to God, the full discovery it makes of the only way of man's salvation, many other incomparable excellencies. But only then does it add, notwithstanding, our full persuasion and assurance of the infallible truth and divine authority thereof is from the inward work of the Holy Spirit, bearing witness by and with the word in our hearts. Now, in practical terms, this double approach works pretty well most of the time. The arguments 
allow believers to fight off their own doubts and to rebut the assaults of outsiders to their own satisfaction. And meanwhile, the appeal to the spirit both fits with their actual devotional experience and also reduces what's at stake in the argument part of the process because believers could rest secure in the knowledge that even if the outer ramparts of their arguments were breached by the hordes of skepticism, the inner citadel was unassailable. And yet, logically, this approach is not entirely satisfactory. Effectively, they're saying, here are a group of arguments which can't persuade you to believe, and here is a reason to believe which is inaccessible to argument. I, I don't say that this approach is broken down. I mean, for myself, I, I still think that Calvin's basic approach to this holds pretty well. But it has been put under quite a lot of pressure. And for the, the second part of, of this morning's lecture, second half of this lecture, I'd like to look with you at some of those pressures and how they've been dealt with. Because appealing to the witness of the spirit in this way did not, in fact, put an end to the argument. Catholics were not silenced by it. Theologians, Catholic theologians like the French Jesuit François Véron mounted a brutally effective case against it. It would go you know, something like this. You know, so the Holy Spirit teaches you that the Bible is the word of God. Does that inner conviction extend equally to all 66 books of the Old and New Testament, to every chapter, to every verse, to nothing else beyond that? Does the Spirit then guide your understanding of those books? If he does, why do other readers interpret it differently? If he doesn't, how could it be that he persuades you that they're true but then doesn't that doesn't guide you as to their meaning. What about those troubling textual variations? Can this sense of inner inspiration help you to discern which is the correct inspired text? How can you be sure? Has the Spirit told you that too? Of course, the purpose of these Catholic arguments wasn't to dismiss the Bible. Catholics are keen on the Bible. But to prove that the Bible's authority ultimately rested on the church and therefore that Christians ought to submit themselves to the church, not to their own judgment or a sense of inner inspiration. But this force, forces some Protestants to double down on the first part, on the argument side. The great Dutch philosopher Hugo Grotius argued that it was possible to attain a moral certainty of Scripture's authority purely by rational argument. But I want to focus on two Englishmen who dealt with this issue, an odd couple pair, um, William Chillingworth and Richard Baxter. Chillingworth was a troubled English Protestant who in his search for certainty had in fact briefly converted to Catholicism, only to find that the cure was worse than the disease. Um, and he returned unhappily to a rather unorthodox Protestantism. He is now best known for his claim usually taken out of context, that, as he said, the Bible, the Bible only is the religion of Protestants, which he, he made in this book during the course of his argument that the Bible could be recognized as authoritative even without having to appeal to the church's witness, as Catholics said. What I want you to notice is not the specific arguments that he makes, but the way he frames them. He does this by lowering the bar for what counts as certainty. And parts of this work better than others. He does a fine job of demolishing the Catholic claims that their doctrine of authority can be held as a matter of demonstrable certainty. He's much less successful in building up his own side of the case. And he does it by trying to distinguish between different kinds of certainty. He says mathematical or scientific certainty is simply not available if you're considering a historical question like the authority of the Bible. He, he frames it as a historical one. And so when he poses the question of, for example, whether we can be confident that the text of Scripture we have is correct, he says, not so certain, I grant, as of that which we can demonstrate, as of something that could be sort of mathematically proven, for example, but certain enough, morally certain, as certain as the nature of the thing will bear, so certain we may be, and God requires no more. This moral certainty is, is, is almost a legal category. 
This is certainty beyond reasonable doubt. It's the certainty with which a jury hangs a criminal or in the other much cited example of the time, the certainty with which you know who your own parents are. It's not something you can prove mathematically, but you, you generally tend to be pretty confident of it. Chillingworth rejects Catholics who claim to have an infallible source of authority. All he claims for Protestants is that they have a manifest source of authority. It's not quite the same. And that lets him turn that barrage of rationalistic arguments from a softening up into the main assault. And he does that simply by declaring victory when he's finished. And he can only do that by changing the terms of the engagement. The most extraordinary passage of this book comes in the preface, where he tells the, the Catholic writer who he's arguing against that, had you represented to my understanding such reasons as being weighed in an even balance with those on the other side, would have turned the scale and made your religion more credible than the contrary. If his opponent had managed to make Catholicism look just a tiny bit more likely, then certainly I should with both mine arms and all my heart most readily have embraced it. Now, you notice the, the juddering, grinding gear change in the middle of that sentence. To begin with, he's talking about these finely balanced reasoned judgments. It could be tipped by a hair on the scale. But then he says that the conclusion he reaches through that process will be one he'll embrace with both my arms and all my heart. Give him 51% confidence that you're right, and he will give you 100% commitment. Now, it's plain enough why he ends up in this weird position. He wants to give 100% commitment because that's what Christians do but he no longer believes that anything much more than 51% certainty is to be had. He's been playing theological beggar my neighbor, ensuring that everybody else's religious arguments are left looking as fragile as his own, and he's making the miserable best of what's left. His contemporary, Richard Baxter, different character, much wiser, more settled, more humane theologian, far more grounded in the faith, in Baxter's great, well, he wrote many great books, but in particular his book of 1650, The Saint's Everlasting Rest, he expressed his concern that most of his fellow Protestants accepted the Bible's authority neither for rational nor for spiritual reasons, but by default and by habit. Indeed, he said, by a, a sort of bastardized Protestant version of the Catholic doctrine of implicit faith, just because the church told them it was true. And so he advanced a whole series of rational arguments of the kind that Chillingworth would have liked to, to prove the Bible. In fact, he cites Chillingworth approvingly. The difference is that he's not mostly arguing with Catholics. He's arguing with spiritualist, radical Protestants who are willing to use an appeal to the direct witness of the Spirit to go beyond Scripture altogether. And that means that Baxter needs the artillery of rational argument. Because the other half of the maneuver, the appeal to the spirit, has already been turned against it. He certainly recognizes the need for the spirit's witness, but he insists that, I confess for my part, I can't boast of any such testimony or light of the spirit which would have made me believe that the book of Canticles, the, the Song of Songs, is canonical and writ by Solomon, and the book of Wisdom, apocryphal or that St. Paul's epistle to the Laodiceans were not canonical as well as John's second and third. Now, I mean, this is merciless. The appeal to the spirit, no matter how powerful, is simply unable reliably to come up with usable answers to the question of what belongs in the canon and what doesn't. And yet, the more arguments men like these piled up, the more they try to redefine what counts as a successful argument, the more it starts to appear that the ground they are building on is shifting sand. It's endlessly debatable. It's not mockers and atheists who are prodding at their structures to see how sound they are. It's earnest believers, people who are seeking fearlessly for the truth, who are refusing to be fobbed off with too easy rationalistic answers. <laughs> 
They don't want these shacks that the church has thrown up. They're searching for God's temple. The alternative was the approach sketched out by the self-taught Baptist teacher Samuel Howe, who in 1640 appealed to the spirit against learned authority. And then he asked how believers can know whether they have the spirit. And he says, no argument will serve. The Spirit of God is a sufficient witness to itself, seeing that the Spirit is truth. Essentially, the same point was made at more length by another English radical, William Woolwin, in the late 1640s. We have a hostile witness telling us that Woolwin said this about the Bible. I believe it's not the Word of God, and I believe, again, it is the Word of God. The scripture is so plainly and directly contradictory to itself that makes me believe it's not. And yet again, all those passages that declare the nature of God, his grace and goodness to men, I believe are. Now, as I say, that comes from a hostile witness. When that accusation is thrown at him, this is what he himself has to say in defense against that charge and others like it. He says in this book, and I think the title of it is, is, is significant. He says, I've been most uncharitably slandered to deny the scriptures to be the word of God because I've opposed insufficient arguments produced to prove them, and because I've refused to show the grounds inducing me to believe them. And he goes on to say that he has never heard a convincing, rational argument that the scriptures are the word of God, and indeed that most of the arguments he has heard weaken rather than strengthen the case. Given some of the distinctly dubious arguments that men like Chillingworth and Baxter advanced, for example, like that the existence of witchcraft proves the truth of the Bible, um, it's hard not to see what he means. But he goes on, I believe them, I believe the scriptures, through an irresistible persuasive power that from within them hath pierced my judgment and affection in such sort that with abundance of joy and gladness I believe, and in believing have that peace which passeth all utterance or expression. And it's this inner power that he compares to Elijah's still soft voice, where the arguments are the earthquake, wind, and fire. So Woolwin knew that the Bible was the word of God, not because he could prove it, but because he just knew. So on one side, you have a rationalism which keeps digging down in the hope of striking a bedrock that it can never find. And on the other hand, you've got a spiritualism which can end up renouncing any search, any search for objective certainty at all. But Baxter and Chillingworth and Howe and Woolwin, all of these people did still accept the Bible as authoritative in different ways, admittedly. Others didn't. On the spiritualist side, you can quickly find yourself with the inspirationalism of the Quakers, who taught that the Bible without is but a shadow of the Bible within. Or on the rationalist side, you could end up like the Dutch anti-Calvinist philosopher Dirk Kornhout, who wrote a treatise on ethics in 1586 without citing the Bible once. And that was a Christian project. His grounds, uh, it seems also to be that a friend challenged him to see whether he could do it. Um, but the basic idea was that he wanted to prove that the Bible's ethics were correct by showing that you could get to a purely biblical position simply by reason alone, that you could get to the same destination by a different route. Now, the point isn't whether or not he succeeded. You can make your own minds up about that. But the very fact that he shows, that he argues, that there is a different route to the same destination implies that the Bible is optional may be ideal, but not a necessity. That tradition is carried on in the next generation, in the next century, by the, the rationalist Dutch group of radicals called the Collegians. One of their best known works, Peter Balling's book, The Light on the Candlestick, 1662, sedulously avoids citing the Bible at all. And his fundamental point is that if you're searching for certainty, you're gonna have to find it somewhere else. A bit like a Quaker, he says that true certainty has to come from the light within. And in his ambiguous usage, that could either mean reason or direct inspiration. Either way, he says, we can judge of no doctrine, of no book that is divine, but by this light, the light within. For example, 
if we experience in th th that the book called the Bible, in regard of the divine doctrine therein comprised, hath such an harmony with that in which God is known, that he must needs have been the author of it, there cannot rationally any more powerful demonstration be demanded. With them that are thus, the scripture may become living and powerful, not a dead letter, as it must needs be to those men who've got no feeling for this. So what do we make of this? On the face of it, he's turning the Bible into a stray leaf blown on the wind, meaning as much or as little as our whim chooses it to let, to let it mean from moment to moment. But squint a little, and how different is it from what Calvin had said a century earlier? Scripture is self-authenticating. We feel the undoubted power of his divine majesty lives and breathes there, a feeling that can be born only of heavenly revelation. I speak of nothing other than what each believer experiences within himself. As I said at the start, I'm not a theologian. But since we're talking about feeling and intuition, I have to say that this feels right to me. And that for all the many problems with Woolwinds and the other spiritualists' approach, I do share that basic intuition that when all the sound and fury of historical and textual argument has passed, it is this still small voice that remains. And I mean that in two senses. Not just that this is what Christians ought to do, up to a point at least, but also that in practice it is what Christians actually do and what we always have. So let me finish these remarks, this, but this, this first lecture, by briefly addressing those two questions of what we ought to do and what we in fact do, the second one first. When we're listening in on arguments about the Bible, um, even more so when we're arguing about it ourselves, it seems to me important that we should remember that this is basically an argument about intuition and feeling rather than about some disinterested reason as if we were adding machines. That applies to us, ourselves, just as much as to the people that we're arguing with. And how could it be otherwise? We are people, we're human beings, we're not computers. We should think with our whole selves. I am not, heaven forbid, suggesting that we should listen to our hearts rather than our heads. The very idea that head and heart are in some way distinct or opposite from one another, that reason and emotion are opposites. This is a piece of philosophical nonsense dreamt up by 17th century rationalists with a deeply impoverished view of reason, and we can't seem to shake it off. Our emotions are profoundly and fundamentally rational. Blaise Pascal, the, the mathematician and profound theologian of the 17th century, who fought a valiant rearguard action against all this head-heart nonsense, famously observed that the heart has its reasons of which reason knows nothing. Reason in the crabbed, narrow sense. If you prefer, what I'm talking about is the difference between logic and wisdom. So of course we read the Bible with our whole selves and bring all of our faculties to it. How would we dare to do anything less? Which means we don't simply deduce a theology of scripture in the abstract and then learn our doctrines from it. We intuit truths, or what seem to us to be truths, through our encounter with scripture and its encounter with us. And through that process, we learn more about how to read scripture. This is all a little abstract, so let me give you an example from my own world, which, as I understand, has some parallels in the Adventist world, too. As you may know, Anglicanism has spent much of the last few decades in a long, agonizing set of debates over women's ministry. And in our polity, with three principal grades of minister, deacons, priests, and bishops, with dozens of independent provinces around the world, with no real jurisdiction over one another, this has been an agonizing process. And it's still going on. The majority of Anglican churches now have accepted women's ordained ministry, but by no means all. Now, naturally enough, one of the main registers in which this debate's been conducted is exegetical. Texts traded back and forth. But one of the things that we learned during this debate was that 
those arguments were not quite what they seemed. I, I don't mean that they were fake. I don't, I'm not suggesting that each side was simply scrabbling around for proof texts in order to support predetermined positions. What I mean is that both sides learned more about how to read the Bible from the way that they approached this debate. It became clear that supporting the ordination of women, and I, I, I should say that I do, I'm proud to have a license from one of the Church of England's first women bishops. Um, it became clear that that position fitted with a certain hermeneutic, and that hermeneutic had wider consequences than just the question of women's ministry. Likewise, the opponents of women's ministry discovered the same thing about their positions. It had other consequences. The terms were different, but the process was similar. I draw attention to this business of discovering more about yourself and your Bible as the two are put into conversation with each other for two reasons. One, that we should be aware that that's what we're doing. We shouldn't make mendacious claims that we've simply discovered our doctrines having opened our Bibles with open and unprejudiced minds. I mean, if we could actually do that, and of course we can't, then I, I, I actually think it would be wrong. It would be a rejection of everything that God has taught us over the course of our lives, all the, the pre-judgments, the acquired wisdom that we bring to everything that we do. So it's inevitable. And also, I should think, it's not something that we should be ashamed of. This is what we do. Of course it is. If we intuit a moral or a theological position about women's ministry or anything else, and then use that intuition and that experience to teach us how to read scripture further and do so with fear and trembling, then I think there's a fair chance that we may be doing the right thing. And that when we fall into error, as we certainly will, that God may nevertheless honor what we've done. And that's my, my final point, the the way to know scripture for what it is, is indeed, it seems to me, to do what the Reformation witness says and to encounter it with our whole selves. If you're faced with the water of life, the right response is not to take samples and to send them to the lab for testing. It's to immerse yourself in it, to be swept along by it, to gulp it down, to, sorry, Anglican moment, to feel the taste of it turning to wine on your tongue. <laughs> and then to strike out into the ocean, trusting that what seems so insubstantial will actually bear us up. And before you say it, yes, I am aware that there are formidable problems with taking such a freewheeling approach to scripture. Um, when we come back this afternoon, I want to think a little more systematically about how we tackle and deal with those problems. But for the moment, that will do. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ryrie, for those, uh, those thoughts and presentations. We have some time for Q&A. We have a lot of time for Q&A, actually. Uh, so uh, who wants to uh, ask our historian, theologian, a good question from what you've heard, stimulating thinking about, um, you know, how much we come to the Bible with our prejudices. Wow, that was a great point. Um, questions, observations you may have uh, you'd like to uh, pose before our guest pre presenter here. Thank, thank you so much. This is Emmanuel, Columbia Union. Um, in your opinion, do you think the Bible was written to be understood by average person, or it was written for the theologians to interpret the Bible to average person? It, it feels like a cop-out to say both, but I'm going to say that. There was, there was a saying, for, is, it, is it Jerome? One of the early church fathers um, has this line which was much quoted during the Reformation, that the Bible is like a river which is shallow enough that the most that a newborn lamb can wade through it without getting its stomach wet, but is also deep enough for an elephant to be able to swim it. 
that it, it is simple enough to be accessible and approachable by, by ordinary believers, and yet has depths that nobody is going to, to plumb. Um, which is a good line, but I think there's some, there's some real truth in that. That if you look at the, at the different texts that make up Scripture, these are, are mostly written you know, for particular circumstances, for particular groups of people. And I, I think if you had spoken to any of the, the biblical authors and said to them, do you imagine that your words are written more for ordinary believers or for great scholars uh, two or three thousand years from now? I think they would have leant towards the ordinary believers. Um, but I think they might have been surprised to, to know how difficult what would seem to them plain and straightforward has, uh, you know, has, has, has often appeared to be in, in later generations. Um, obviously, you know, what, one of the, the greatest problems of biblical interpretation has always been seeing what is right there plainly in front of our faces which is something that as human beings we're very bad at doing. I, I appreciate you bringing us to appreciate uncertainty. And you've, you've brought us to appreciate that that is where we arrive due to the contradictions and the intricacies of translation and the history of, of where biblical passages come from. You've challenged us to bridge that gap rather than the way the Catholics have done it through the authority or traditions of the church, but you've brought us to bridge that gap through faith and experience. My question is, doesn't that still leave us with the subjective uncertainty? And are you calling us then to be comfortable with that level of of uncertainty and be simply seekers rather than knowers. Comfortable with it? No. I don't think the business of being a sinner in this world is a comfortable one um, or that we should necessarily simply be, be at ease with the fact that we, we can only see as, as, as through a glass darkly. Um, we, I don't think we should be sort of putting up our feet and relaxing about that. Um, I'm enough of a Calvinist to, to feel that we, 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 we need to be, to be striving towards the light. But I also think we need to recognize how fundamentally weak and flawed we are. I mean, not just because we're, we're sinners, but because we're human. We are limited, finite creatures living in a particular time and place with, with all the, the limitations that that places on us. Um, human beings, maybe Christians especially, maybe Protestants in particular, do have a tendency to overestimate our own importance. Um, <laughs> And you know, one of the consequences of spending a lot of time thinking about God is you can almost make the mistake of starting to imagine that you are looking at the world from God's point of view. Um, you know, we really you know, know very, very little about him or about anything. Um, I think that we are much more in danger of overestimating the amount of, of certainty that we can claim um, and say, yes, we have this fixed thing that we, and it's, it's a way of making the world revolve around us. Um, when Luther talks about faith, it's in terms of not of intellectual assent, but of personal dependence. Um, the, the faith that, uh, that, that, that a baby has in the person carrying. Um, not that they can prove that that person isn't going to stumble and fall, but the question doesn't arise. 
um, and it's the feeling of the arms around you that is what carries you forward. Thank you. This has uh, been, been thoughtful and stimulating. And I'm, I'm wondering, when you take um, this self-authenticating concept, and, and you have that in the New Testament with all scriptures, God read, and, and that, that's, that's clearly a part of it. But what, what are the safeguards so you don't bridge into the everyone does what is right in their own mind kind of thing? What, um, what are the safeguards that, that bring us together as a body of believers and, and help us to collectively define um, our understanding of Scripture so that it's not just if everyone feels that, well, this is self-authenticated self and that is course that's probably how we get all our denominations but what how would you describe the safeguards that's that's a really good question and I, I hope you'll forgive me for saying that you've I mean you've just perfectly articulated the Roman Catholic argument against the, 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 the Protestant view of this um, but <laughs> Thank you. Maybe, maybe you won't forgive me um, <laughs> And I should say that 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 particular question is one that I'm going to be talking more about about this afternoon. So I don't want to, to get too much into that now. It's really important. Um, but in brief, there's I think a, just an ongoing dialogue between that kind of sense of, of of inner inspiration that's guiding you, but which ultimately, is, in a sense, is incommunicable. And you're left with a sense of, well, hey, you know, this is my truth, what's yours? Which, you know, can't get you anywhere in terms of actually building a community or being able to agree on something. And having a, a fixed text, which you can be tested against, which can, can serve as a yardstick to measure the convictions that you've received and to, to, by which the community can discern what, what, you've, what you've reached. I think the practical experience of the Protestant churches has been that that sort of collective discernment can work quite a lot of the time, which is, is why instead of there being billions of churches of a single person, we have you know, great international denominational families. Yet, nevertheless, we will repeatedly, when put under sufficient pressure, it's been the, the pattern, the witness, I think the glory of Protestants, in the end to say, no. My conscience is captive to the word of God, as Luther would say. I will not accept what my community, whatever that is, tells me if my conscience tells me something else. Um, most of the time, of course, most of us aren't in the position of having to make that kind of decision. And, you know, Only in October. We, we, we give thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> but when it does come to it, um, I, I think the Protestant witness is, is ultimately that we follow our consciences uh, wherever they may lead us. Before the next question, is it, go ahead, guys, go to the microphone. I have a question while they're going to the microphone. Um, so we give a lot of credit to our good friends in the medieval church or Roman church of holding up tradition mm -hmm. as authority. But as an observer of history and a student of it, as you are, what do you see in Protestantism where that becomes an issue in Protestantism where we say, oh, sola scriptura, and then pretty soon as you watch the cycle of a denomination or movement when tradition tries to put its head up and say, oh, guess what? We have tradition here, and this is what really is the authority. And we turn back and say to Rome, ooh, look what you did, but aren't we doing the same? Yeah. That's absolutely right. I mean, I, 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 and, and I think it's, it's right that it should be so, because, you know, I mean, the appeal to tradition has all kinds of problems to it. But one of the great virtues that it does show is humility. It's the, the willingness to say, you know, okay, I've come up with this, this set of, of, of ideas and thoughts, but I need to measure this against what all the saints of God 
have, have taught and believed and prayed for over all the centuries. And it takes a fair leap of arrogance to say, well, I think they were all wrong and that I'm right. And so that, that willingness to submit yourself and test yourself against the accumulated wisdom of Christians down the ages, I think is a good one. Uh, and of course, Protestant churches do this as well. And you know, the, 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 the extent to which within particular denominational families, the, the witness of their founders or their founding documents you know, becomes, becomes really important. I think this is true in every long-lived denomination. There is a difference, though, but, uh, uh, between that kind of respect for tradition and the particular approach that is taken in the Catholic world, which is that the, the Catholic Church, for its own you know, perfectly coherent reasons, claims in a, you know, quite a limited number of cases, but still claims to be able to make definitive statements of truthful doctrine the pronouncements of, of ecumenical councils, ex-cathedral pronouncements by the Pope, very rare, but um, these things are, are definitive and they are fixed. I think in every Protestant tradition, there is always there at the bottom a recognition that the tradition, as powerful as it is and as much as we, we respect it, may include errors, may include fundamental errors which may possibly need to be revisited and revised. So it's possible that a practice you know, such as the Sunday Sabbath, which has been you know, honoured by Christian practice for, for, for many, many centuries, that it's possible in the Protestant world to go back to that and say, that was wrong. A mistake was made very early on, and therefore we can, we can revisit it. That ability to to look back on our tradition and, where necessary, repent of it is something that seems to me differentiates Protestants of any kind from, from, from the Catholic approach to tradition. Thank, thank you, Dr. Yeah, we got, we got time. Thank you. Uh, Senator Mike, and then go to the former. Yeah, I'm just curious, uh, since uh, you spoke about uh, Calvin, mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, as a historian, um, you wrote so many brilliant things, but when you say Calvin, some people were reporting. Uh, well, you may be asking this to the wrong person because I confess to being a bit of a fan. Um, Calvin, the, the, his, his most recent, um, or the best of his most recent biographers, starts by saying that um, Calvin never believed that he'd met anybody who was his own intellectual equal and that he was probably right. Um, you know, he, he, you know, that, he, he's, he's a sort of mixture of contradictions. Um, there are these moments of kind of luminous spiritual clarity in him. He can, can have a warmth and generosity which his reputation um, would not lead you to expect. But if you pick a fight with him, he is not going to back down. Um, you know, he, is, he is not a gracious opponent. Um, and his, you know, one of the recurrent features of his career is his inability to walk away from an argument. Um, and you know, I, I, it, it comes out of that same sort of in, tremendous intellectual self-confidence that he's got. And the fact that the self-confidence is justified doesn't make it any more attractive. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he's, he will be challenged on something, and his instinct is to dig in his heels and to double down on that point. And of course, I mean, his reputation is, is, is tied up above all with the doctrine of predestination. That, that, that he develops, which, when he first articulates it, is, is a point that he, you know, is woven into the fabric of his theology, but he, he doesn't want to make a big deal out of it pastorally, and to emphasize the mystery of it, and say, you know, this is, this is something that you should be careful on, on, on touching on in preaching. Um, you know, it's, so it's there, but it's, it's, it doesn't have kind of flashing lights tied around it. Um, he's then challenged. On, on this point, and he reacts the way he always does when he's challenged. Um, and towards the end of his career, and even more after his death, it becomes a touchstone. 
and you know a real shibboleth of, of division for for for, for Calvinists. Um, to the extent, of course, that as so often happens in these cases, it his doctrine of predestination is developed and refined and frankly weaponized to a degree that I don't think he had ever anticipated. And I think there's there's a real case in which you can say that Calvin was not fully a Calvinist um, in, 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 in the sense that that gets developed, developed later on. Um, so there's, there comes to be a, an almost cruel edge to the way that that doctrine is used and certainly to the way that it's experienced, which I think is a distortion of, of how he would have applied it. Um, we forget that Calvin was writing out of, uh, out of situations of exile and of persecution, um, in which his community were, were being hounded and killed. Um, and under those circumstances, to be able to say to people who are facing you know, painful death, um, I, I, and, and you know, having to, to try to, to find the strength within themselves, as it seemed to them, to stand up for their faith in the, you know, against the threat of burning, to say to them, no, this is not about you and your ability to stand firm in your faith. You are chosen. You are God's predestined. Um, God's sovereignty is what's in charge in this situation, not your fading strength. And so it's that ability to, to trust that your salvation is not something that you hold in your own hands, but something that is... is you know, was decided on by God before the beginning of the world. That has, has a, a tremendous pastoral power to it in, in his time that Calvinists in more peaceful circumstances have, have found difficult to recover, and I think we do well to remember that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ryrie, for this awesome lecture. Um, I'm a student at WAU, uh, future uh, minister. Um, so, at the risk of having a very, very elementary question <laughs> uh, in the presence of so many theologians and educators and all, um, I, I want to make sure I don't miss this point um, as a future minister. Um, so, knowing the fact that this debate of the authority of, of, the, of Scripture, of the Word of God, um, uh, going on for so many, for so many years, uh, how does this relate to uh, a minister and his work within evangelism. So uh, when, when I go on to be a minister, how am I going to face this situation and how is this going to, knowing this information going to help me in those situations? Is it going to be something to where um, all of a sudden everybody I meet, I'm going to start, hey, you know, you got to have faith in order to, because faith, through faith you understand the authority of God. Is it something where you choose your battles? Um, or is it more of a personal thing uh, that, that, that we should know and hold on to so that we could uh, uh, continue in our faith and, and knowing that Scripture's uh, uh, authority comes from God? Whenever somebody stands up and says they're going to ask a really elementary question, I get nervous and for, 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 for good reason. Um, I'm not going to presume to tell you how your ministry within the context that you're going to be working should should be conducted. I'm, I'm a, a lay preacher working in a very different context. Um, and I'll be addressing some of those questions a little bit this afternoon. All I'll say now um, is that the doctrine of the Holy, of, of, of the Holy Scripture is a part of and subordinate to our doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The, 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 the highest claim that Christians have ever made about Scripture is that it is inspired by the Holy Spirit and that the Spirit speaks to us through Scripture. It's one of the, 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 the primary place where we encounter the Spirit. I worry sometimes in some traditions, I don't know if this is true in Adventism, that the, the Bible has almost been treated as the third person of the Trinity in its own right. Um, and that we should remember that the power of 
scripture is the encounter that we have with God above all within the person of the Spirit through it. Um, that perspective, it seems to me, is really important for us for us to maintain. That's that's what what scripture is. Um, I've found in my own preaching that it's trying to to be a channel through which the words of scripture and the work of the spirit can speak through you to your community um, that can be what works different people will have different experiences but that's that's been mine Um, those, those are the questions for this time. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Okay, good.